Hey, hey everyone. How is it going? Good, Lee. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to have you join the stream and just kind of talk more and, and hear more about the product you're building and, and some of the, the really cool applications of the technology. So um, you want to just give a quick intro of yourself and then we'll, we'll jump in? Hey, yeah. Uh, I'm Sujay. I'm one of the co-founders here at Convex. Um, and yeah, I have been, we've been working on Convex for close to about a year now and super excited to be here and show what we've been working on. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I had heard of, I've heard of Convex. I, I checked out the website. It was beautifully designed and I, it really piqued my interest where I wanted to learn more about the product and actually get my hands on it and try it out. So before I give kind of my understanding <laughs> of, of what it is, I'd love to hear your, your, how you describe the product and, and how you, how you think it fits in the market. Absolutely. Um, in, in short, Convex is a really easy to use backend as a service that helps with managing global state, specifically for now in web applications. And one thing we've noticed is that serverless led by companies like Purcell is happening. It's super, super easy and amazing to get started building web apps with tools like Purcell. But some of that magic hasn't quite extended to dynamic applications yet. And Convex is here to help you with that because the hard part is that dynamic applications require global state so if I'm building, you know, for some reason, if I'm building a Twitter clone, like I got to store, <laughs> I got to store those tweets somewhere, right? And static content doesn't suffice for user generated stuff like that. And usually managing this global state is really hard. I have to think about databases. I got to think about building an API on top of it and caching and deployment. And then I got to think about like, how does it interact with my state management in my app? And usually people have needed to spin up whole teams to manage stuff like that. So Convex is super easy to use system that just takes care of all of it for you. Nice, nice. Uh, hey, everyone who's joining in, thank you. Thank you for joining us live. If you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll also have some fun Q&A here in a little bit as well too. But I love that definition. Um, the, way, the way that I've, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the word state a lot because yeah. as front-end developers, we talk a lot about state and there's various different types of state. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is it's, it's almost lifting this state up and providing a really clean abstraction for how you manage your reactive state across your entire, uh, across your entire backend. But really it, it leaks into the front-end as well too, because you know, the, the lines of separation there and how I write my use whatever hook to fetch my data, the, the, the closer we can uh, pair those tools together and make them aware of each other, you can get some really magical experiences. Absolutely. And I think like normally when we think about things like databases and we think about building backends, we think about it in like a really like top down approach where we're thinking like, oh, am I using Postgres or MySQL? Am I maybe using Dynamo or Fauna or whatever? And then I'm like, okay, well then like, Maybe I'm going to put Redis on top and then, oh, like maybe I want to have a GraphQL. And like, these are all things that are coming, starting from the, the concerns and the difficulties and the technologies of the back end and going down. And like you said, like when you're coming from the bottom up and I have a lot of state that I'm used to managing already, like the state that's ephemeral within my user interface, whether it's a URL state, I have a lot of tools for managing that already, like React use state hook, for example. And... What Convex is trying to do is instead of trying to like take a step back and instead of going from the top down and really getting our heads in database land, starting from the bottom up, saying what are we already used to doing within the front end, within the web browser, and just giving you the bare minimum to make your app globally with that. So in this back end for Convex, are we talking about relational data? Are we talking about um, NoSQL like, what, what does this world look like? Am I already on the wrong track by trying to think about the specific technologies? Or can I think about it in a more abstract way? Yeah, it's like going and starting from a very specific, is this NoSQL, is this relational? Do I have to, is it serializable? These are all, yep. I think, things that are like very, very specific details of very specific yeah. technologies. And, and we'll take a look, you know, as we walk through this app, I think there's like a much easier, simpler way to do it where we just, take the existing apps we have and just 
with a small amount of the small tweaks and with using the technologies you already know, like JavaScript and with like our React books and state management, we can get a app that works globally. Yeah, I, what's interesting to me is, you know, I, coming from the front end development background, I've seen tutorials that start out with, you know, you write some JSON data, it's hard coded in your React component. Maybe you abstract that out to local storage. And then it's almost, it's like the meme of draw an owl where it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, and now all of a sudden I need to move this to a backend that's globally distributed, like replicated. And as a front end developer, it's like, wait a minute. I have to learn all of these new concepts. I, I, you know, I might not even know the the nuances between relational or non-relational data as you're as you're expanding more into that backend. But when you abstract that and the the vision that you're you're selling, where it's just I have a reactive backend, it connects with my front end, it makes it easy to manage my data. I think that's really appealing and appetizing for a lot of developers who maybe are a little burnt out about having to make really fine grain uh, database choices or caching choices. They kind of just want things to just work for the majority use case. Absolutely. And one of the developers we work with, Mike, who's a front end developer, I think I'm quoting him and he says it like, those decisions just suck all the fun. They suck all the joy <laughs> out of building our apps, right? And like when we, I think, you know, like I love like building like small little hobbyist apps, like the one will um, be looking at. And yeah. normally before, and I actually use Convex for a lot of my own like kind of small apps now. Uh -huh. um, and before, like you kind of hack on it. And then honestly, like before you, before Vercel, you have to figure out how am I going to deploy this? And it's such, yes. there's so many paper cuts along the way. And then I would just go and watch TV or something else. Right. And yeah. I think like those paper cuts and that like draw the rest of the owl situation when you have yes. to add some storage and state on your back end. It's just, it makes it, it sucks all the fun out. I don't like, I'm just gonna go do something else. And with Convex, we're trying to make that super easy and super fluid. That's, that's really exciting. I've, I've noticed too, talking to a lot of front end developers, there is, when they're trying to build maybe a, a weekend project, they're trying to build a little fun application and, and try out some of these technologies. As a lot of the front end tools have moved to be global first, to essentially allow you to build and deploy around the world, kind of scale up or down as you need. It's also required them to think a little bit about how that backend interfaces with the front end and what those constraints might be. And I think for a lot of those developers, that, that, uh, that challenge is very overwhelming. So I am curious to, to, to dive into this and see Absolutely. what that looks like. So maybe you want to, uh, maybe you want to pull up your, your screen and we can look at some code and um, try to see what questions I have, see if I can poke holes in my understanding of, of what Convex does and see how it aligns to my existing mental model of what a backend is, what a database is, and what might be, uh, what might be a little different with, with Convex. Let's do it. Okay, awesome. So I will, uh, I'll pull up your screen share here and add it in here and we have a demo app. Cool. Yeah. So um, we can actually put up this URL in the live stream. Um, I built this small little app, livestream-qna.versel.app for actually this live stream. And so I've put in a bunch of questions here. And as we're watching, folks can upvote and download questions. Oh, here, I'll... Okay. oh wow. I'm, I'm seeing an update on my side very, very yeah. quickly. Yeah. And... Um, as you know, play play with it as we're walking through um, how this app is actually built, and at the end we'll use the votes to, um, <laughs> <laughs> to see what questions to answer. Now, because I just hacked this up in like an hour, there Convex has support for authentication and login, but um, I didn't do it for this app, so don't like just click on the same thing a ton of times. <laughs> you could, but like, come on. I'm, I'm very impressed with how responsive it feels. Just to yeah. quickly comment on like. I'm seeing, I have my local version here and then I have the stream version and they're, they're very in sync and Absolutely. you know, we're, we're geographically in different areas too. So that's, that's nice. Yeah. And we'll talk about this more um, once we walk through the app, but one of the things which is really important to us at Convex um, is having, providing the right abstractions. So developers fall into the pit of success. And yeah. one of the components of that is 
all of the data you fetch on Convex is reactive by default because you're working within React, which is a reactive framework. And why should state that comes from the back end be different than from anything else? Yes. I think uh, I think other people are, <laughs> are <interested laughs> here. This is sick. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad everyone's here joining live and and being able to check out this demo. Um, so talk to me about how Convex knows to receive updates in real time. Is this a is it polling? Is it a WebSocket? Is it what's the what's the implementation of that that allows it to receive updates? Totally. It's using a WebSocket from the browser to Convex's servers. And because, and we'll talk a lot more about the details of how this stuff is set up, um, but because Convex controls both the functions that are getting executed, which we run ourselves, these JavaScript functions, and the underlying storage in the database, um, we can have really, really high precision uh, notifications where we know that when you are running a particular query, so to here to say, to list all the questions and get their scores, we can really precisely update it whenever someone mutates something that depend that the data depends on, just like how React works in your browser. Nice, nice. So, is would you say that some of the some of the mental models that developers have for React can be applied to the model of of Convex? Exactly. That's the dream. Is take you know stuff that we already the React team and the whole ecosystem on the front end has iterated on over the past few years and take that magic and just kind of, we, I think we had the back end on the top, the front end on the bottom when we were talking about it before, like, you know, pull that magic up, keep it, use the same abstractions that people are familiar with and just mm -hmm. get them working end to end. Awesome. Well, let's look at some code. Let's take a look. I see people are <laughs> very <laughs> enthusiastic and using uh, the upvotes and downvotes. So thanks thanks for those in the chat here live. It, look, it looks like there might be, a, there was briefly some competition for first and second, but <laughs> so now it's gone. All right. The people have spoken, bring out the code. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no hiding the code. Cool, so I just you know used create next app to get started with this. Um, nice. Should hopefully be familiar. Um, I didn't actually change very much here. Um, <laughs> the one thing that is different now is that um, I Convex provides its client using a context. So um, yeah. I'm most of my app is in this Q&A component, and I'm using Convex provider here to take the Convex client and provide it within this component. Um, and so let's walk through how this app works. Um, you know, it's, I'm not the world's greatest web developer, so uh, <laughs> hopefully people aren't going to flame me too much <laughs> in here, but I don't know, we'll see. Uh, there's, yeah, um, we'll talk a little bit more about how this works, but use query here says um, call into Convex to load all of the questions that are currently on the back end, and we get that um, here in questions. And we'll talk more about how the upvoting and downvoting works, but also okay. for the questions. And then I pretty much just do questions.map and render them. So um, I can provide the key based on the ID that's provided. I have a function here that I think adds a color if the vote's negative or positive. And uh -huh. then we'll talk about the uploading, downloading later, but then I have two buttons to do that with the right thumbs up. So okay. that is it on the front end. So all of the live updating and the, um, how uh, this just happens automatically is taken care of by the framework. <laughs> so your React hooks support like a use query hook or a use mutation hook support optimistic updates, refocusing uh, on the browser or on that window will actually trigger the update to, to happen again. Um, and there's a WebSocket connection that's open that's just constantly being able to receive new updates from your convex instance, right? Yep. Yep, exactly. And so we'll talk about, there's a lot of kind of interesting stuff here around the optimistic updates. So making mutations feel really, really snappy. Um, but yeah, like all the stuff just is coordinated automatically by the Convex client. What's the key there on uh, questions, colon, uh, you know, in the use query at, yeah. the, at the top? Is, oh. Yeah, qu questions, ah, colon, yes. load questions. Yes. So 
when you use query here, this calls into a function that you register on Convex's backend. So, and as we will add a new function if we have time to like add some new okay. functionality, um, and we'll see the flow for like pushing to Convex. Um, but here, the format is this is the name of your file. So here, I have questions at TypeScript and okay. then colon, oops, um, and the colon and the name of the function within the file. So if we go here. Within the convex directory, these are all functions that run on convex's backend. Just like how um, for Rcel, we have an API directory that are functions that get pushed to Rcel. Yep. Um, yep. The convex directory here has all the stuff that we send over to run on convex. So we so the, uh, the atomic unit of of action right is a function. You write. You need some logic, some compute. You write a function. It executes that thing. Exactly. And so those functions constitute the API between your front end and your back end. So Got you, it. like here, um, you mark a function as being part of your API by exporting it like this. You do export, load questions, and we have this query decorator. And then you create this function, which takes in a database. So con to start then, Convex provides a database object that lets you store state. Got it. So this, these functions, these convex functions run on the server mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, is that code running close to your users? Is it trying to be uh, placed close to them regionally? I'll be honest with where we're at right now because we're in an early stage startup. Right now, everything's in US East 1. But yep. um, the, you know, the way that the system is designed is that we can distribute this all over the world. And we'll talk a lot about how um, like all of these queries execute at a particular snapshot. So you see fully consistent results of the database. And because we control things going all the way from the JavaScript that's getting executed to the underlying database, we like wrote a database, right? Um, we can have this database get replicated all around the world and we can execute things and have them be consistent. So going back to the pit of success, like we don't want people to have to think about like, well, I like created a user here and I created a comment over here. And then maybe I like, I'm able to see the comment without the user existing. So now I have to handle that. Yep. Yep. So you've essentially what you're saying is you've designed the system, you've designed the backend in such a way that you'll be able to put it as close to your customer as possible. Um, you know, you've, you've thought ahead, you've had the fore, forethought for that architecture. Exactly. And one of the things that's also really important to us as part of the architecture is that we can, just like whenever we deploy um, static content, we push it to a CDN and we want to have the same level of performance. We want it to be that you don't have to really think about what parts of your app are static versus dynamic. You just write your code. You can use a bunch of dynamic content like we're doing here, and you'll get the same performance. We'll push all of this data out to the edge. And because we have very fine grain and validation, you won't have to like pull it and re refresh it every time. You'll be able to know very, excuse me, very precisely when it's changed. And the system will handle that automatically for you. Got it. So inside of this function, which runs on the server, my follow-up then is two questions. First is, what environment does this run in? Can I NPM install anything? And then the second question is, I see this db.table syntax to allow you to go to your questions table and fetch some information. Is this db object, is that a type safe object? Do I get access to all those properties? Cool. Um, so, so the first question, um, the, we are still figuring out exactly the environment. The intent is that you should be able to use most of your packages on NPM. So we are providing something that's kind of close to the web browser environment. So if you nice. have a web version of your NPM package, then it should work. And you know, we still got some work to do to implement all of those standards. Um, but one important caveat there, and we'll go into this in more detail, I'm sure, is that these convex functions have to be fully deterministic to be cached the way that we want. So we support things like math.random and date.now, which aren't deterministic kind of by design, right, for randomness. 
but mm -hmm. we pin them to be, we pin the random seed for math.random, or we pin the system time to whatever date that now returns. So those should all work. But then if you are using an, AP, um, an NPM package that needs to talk to the external world, if it needs to go talk to Stripe or um, like yep. fetch some data from another system, uh, that won't work because querying, talking to the external world breaks determinism, which then means that we can't cache this result. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. So that was the first question. Um, the second question was around type safety. So we can actually even just take a look at how this works. Um, so one thing we've worked a lot on is making sure that autocomplete is, is out. So here, one thing you'll notice is that we don't actually yet have type safety on the table name. So it's, we're, but that's something we're working on. Uh -huh. um, but here I can do filter, do, and then, I don't know, maybe you like what uh, you know. I want to look for um, rows that have the like their text field equal to high or something. And so the kind of the, the structure of the API is designed to be very auto-completable in TypeScript. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing, you know, just out of you know, the transparency, right? We don't have type safety yet for like things like the table names or things like the fields. So like there's not a idea of taking the schema of the database and reflecting it into the type system. But that's something mm -hmm. we're working on. It's like designed to do that. And we'll actually see that we have, um, we auto-generate type safe bindings to your function. So when we add a new function, we'll look on how within the front end, you'll get type safety and auto-completion for all of your APIs. And yeah, let's let's dive into what that, what that workflow would look like to maybe add add either a new function or modify one of these functions, like make a change and actually see that updated. Yeah, cool. So um, let's start with just tweaking a function because that's probably Perfect. a little bit easier. So yeah. how about for mutation here for, uh, for this upvote? Um, say like we want to say that like whenever you upvote, you get two and downloads only one. It's like okay. more positive. So yeah. here, um, all I need to do is change it. Then um, here I've already um, authenticated my convex instance here. Uh -huh. So I'm going to do npx convex push. Right, so it said that I'm uh, updating the questions.js module. And then oh, actually, I didn't need to refresh. Sorry, it's just <laughs> out of just have it. Out of oh. habit, seriously. <laughs> yeah. Now the upvotes are rolling in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's actually change it back because you know, it's kind of weird. But uh, it's interesting. So you authenticated in the console. You made that secure connection between your terminal and your your browser or your instance in the in the cloud of Convex. And then you push, and it uses the Convex API to deploy those functions, correct? Yep. Okay. And one of the cool things is because... Um, the way Convex is built is that I refresh out of habit, but even like tweaking your code will mean that it automatically reruns all of the queries that depend on that code. So you don't have to like refresh your app to pick up new code changes. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So that's modifying an existing function. Yeah. Is the workflow similar if you added a new function where it just automatically recognizes that when you do a push? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to npm run dev, right? Because I want to add some probably new UI for our function. Okay. All right, cool. So um, this is the same. It's connecting to the same convex backend as the live one, but I'm... Um, this is with the front end being served locally. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And so I think like what would be kind of fun is maybe something like um, we can roll the dice, you know, to like have like uh, uh, add a mystery number of upvotes or downvotes to a particular option. Okay. Uh, So convex gives us these functions that we can define like opt. Well, in this instance of saying function, I'm talking about a JavaScript function, uh -huh. like optimistic upvote 
or optimistic downvote. And we could do something very similar here where it's a, yeah, it's using a mutation. Yep. Got it. So, and actually maybe before we jump into adding the new thing, so we walked through the queries um, and why don't we walk through the kind of mutations real quick just to see how everything works from top okay. to bottom. So here um, we'll talk about the optimistic stuff in a bit. Um, the upvote uh, value here is using the upvote function on the server inside my questions module. So if we go here, um, we pass in this ID, which identifies a document within Convex, and we get it from the database. If it's not there already, we return. If it is there, we add one to the votes and write it back to the database. Downvote looks pretty much exactly the same, right? So these functions are the ones that run on our server and either add or remove a vote from a particular question, right? Got it. And then how do we call that? So here, um, I can actually even demo the autocomplete. So these use mutation. Um, I get automatically all of the functions that are defined. So here, um, and I have the mutation function. And if I want to, and we'll talk, and we'll talk about the optimistic stuff soon, but I can just say for the on click for here, just call upvote with the ID of the question that's being rendered for this button. And that's it. When you hook that up, everything happens end to end automatically. And then, so what's the difference between that and then the optimistic upvote? Right. So, it's no matter how fast the backend is, I think like from the kind of the HCI principles of making sure that um, things are feedback is given to the user very quickly when they take an action, no matter how fast the backend is, it's not going to be fast enough to make the most demanding experiences feel really snappy to the user, right? Like if yeah. we click a button and, you know, at best it's going to be 100 milliseconds, you know, 200 milliseconds to go to the back end, do a write to the database and come back. That's like good enough for a lot of things, but it's not good enough for everything, right? Like we won't, even on the, um, for the counters, wow, counts have gotten really high. <laughs> I'm glad commenting, yeah. Also, People are just uh, counting for days. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, here like, and um, maybe actually we can, maybe in my local version, well, in my local version, I'll get rid of the optimistic updates. Um, and we'll see how it like it it feels fine but it doesn't feel super snappy so let's actually we'll do that yeah that makes a lot of sense is that as you're doing that the question that comes to my mind is how is that cash managed yes absolutely okay um so you can see here i'm, I'm floating a question that isn't um other people aren't touching <laughs> and you can see like it's fine but it's not yeah. like you know yeah i mean and that is since right you'd have to add like you know either a disabled or loading state while the api api call was pending to prevent a double click and giving that user feedback but what you're saying is with the optimistic ui you're making the you're making the assumption that the call is successful and immediately giving that feedback to the user. And then you only handle the error case, right? Then you could say, okay, actually it didn't work. So go back to my cache and decrement that value. Exactly. And so one of the cool things is that Convex actually handles a lot of that for you hundred percent automatically. So um, when in the business of like rolling back optimistic changes and everything, it just happens uh, pretty easily. So here um, when you, Call the with optimistic update function on the upvote mutation. You get a you pass in a function that takes in the query store. So this is like the local cache of all of the query functions that are used within your app, and it takes in the argument ID, which was passed into upvote. And here I've made a helper function apply increment, which takes this, the query store, the ID. And the delta here is either you're adding one vote here or removing one vote for downvoting. Uh -huh. And within this function, um, we get the query that this mutation uh, affects. So here we look at the load questions query. And if it hasn't been loaded yet, return. If it has, go and 
update it in place or up, return a new version of it um, that finds the question that's being changed and modifies the votes to include that increment. Yep. Then sort it again and set the query back in the local cache. Got it. And like you were saying, a lot of the difficulties of managing things like optimistic updates and other frameworks is that you have to handle the transition points where I have this optimistic update at some point in time, and then the mutation succeeds, and then I need to make sure that it like rolls back the optimistic thing I did and puts the result that succeeded atomically in the same, so yeah, I don't get a flicker in the UI where one disappears and the other's there. Or then if it fails, I need to roll it back. This actually takes care of all of that for you. Got it. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So then once you attach those um, functions, the optimistic update functions to the mutations, then you kind of just call it just like the other stuff worked. You just call yep. it with the ID you want, and then it just works. Um, <laughs> despite it being the most downloaded question, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this since we're on the topic <laughs> of mutations. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, um, one of the kind of magical things with convicts is you actually you don't really have to retry mutations. Like if, the, if your browser disconnects from the internet or if there's some, uh, something flakes along the way, if you're on Wi-Fi or whatever, um, convicts actually internally retries your mutations for you. So it's another thing. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, that's another thing where, you, as a developer, you just we just want people to fall into the pit of success. If you have a mutation that gets initiated by your app, Convex will make sure that it gets to the back end. And we internally have like an item potency key, and we do all of that type of thing to make sure that you're, if you're incrementing, um, if you're upvoting a question, it gets upvoted exactly once. Even when you retry, it. it won't like get like upvoted a bunch of times when you have some network issues. Got it. Okay, so let's add the uh, let's add the new row with the yeah. with the new new button, a new mutation. Actually, sorry. is there a dice? Oh, there is. Yes. Okay. Cool. Nice. Roll the dice. Roll the dice. Okay. Uh, honestly, I like to just make sure that this. <laughs> uh, okay. Cool. So that is yeah. it. All right. Looks good. Get... Looks good. Okay. So what we'll do is here in the questions file, let's add a new mutation. Right. And as you're writing that up, just thinking out loud here. So whether you're doing a use query or a use mutation, again, that atomic unit of work is the function. Exactly. So is that if we're if we're speaking in HTTP, is that like a is the, is the query the git and the, <laughs> the mutation is the, the put or post? Yeah, so po I mean, I guess there, since it's it's enforced to be item potent by the framework, I guess it's kind of like a put, but yeah, I guess it depends what. <laughs> I, yeah. You know, I'm sure there's some very fine detail in the REST specification that <laughs> can go oh, yeah. here, but yeah, it's, um, it's just, yeah, I think, and this is where I think it's, we want to really meet developers where they are, it's like, hey, look, I just want to upload this. I want to download it. I don't want to have yes. to think about retries or network connectivity or item potency or anything. Just like make it work. Yep. Yep. Um, so, you know, one thing is that right now I have to write these type annotations manually because we don't have um, uh, type safety yet for stuff in our database, but that is coming soon. Okay. So we go to our database, we, we fetch an item based on the ID. If, if it's not there, then we can just uh, eject out. Otherwise, we take our, our document, which yeah. gives, me, gives me the Firebase vibes of yeah. the, the term document, which yeah. is, is, is it interesting as you're walking through this. It reminded me of one of the things that I really, when I started to really love working on the front end was back when I was using, well, parse, yeah. Firebase, uh, it just really simplified that mental model where you could just write a db.git and grab that information. Um, right. And yeah, I, I think that resonates here as well. I might need some help for you and or the stream. I think math.random is like a return between zero and one, right? And then it's maybe we want to like have between zero and 10. And maybe we yeah, want that should work. 
maybe and then we want it to be between minus five and positive five. And then I think is it math dot round? Math dot I think you can do like math dot floor. And floor. then okay. cool. I think that should work. Because then it's a Perfect. random number times whatever the maximum you want is. So that would give you like a number between one and ten, I believe. Okay. And then um Okay, and then I want Maybe to. Maybe we don't it. even need the minus five then. I want to get some down votes, so. though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is true. You know, you roll the dice, something good might happen, something bad might happen. You never know. I like it. I like it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and actually, okay, cool. So then, um, and then let's write this to the back to the database, and that's it. Okay, cool. And that's for now. Um, let's shoot to the. I can make that new function available. Um, the other thing we'll do, and this will eventually have something kind of like a convex dev command that does all of this for you and watches for changes, but for right now it's a little manual. Um, there's a cogen that will generate the type safe client side binding. So we'll use them right now. So when you push, do you push that new function? Yep, exactly. Got it. Okay. Um, that's uh, so that happened here. Um, maybe we can actually combine these into like an update. Anyways, um, and so here I've written the new version of the questions module. Yep. Um, and generated the new bindings to it, so I can do okay. the dice and call the new mutation. And there it is. Oh, cool. Voila. Nice. And okay, so we'll start with just. Where does that auto-generated client live? Like, if I if I remember correctly, with like Prisma, I think when you auto-gen the client, it lives in the node modules folder. It does. Um, for now, we have it here inside your convex directory. Okay. Um, so this is what the the code yeah, generated function looks like. Like here's the type. Um, and, and do you commit that, or do you get ignore that? Um, for now, we commit it. And I think like still, you know, I'd be we'd actually love a ton of feedback from folks who are using this on like what um, workflows that really works well for them. I think I was like, we tried a little bit of like the kind of sneaking it in the node modules directory, but then that felt like you know could could lead to a lot of really weird bugs, you know, where like people have yeah. different versions and then but their package and package locked at JSON look the same, but then the node modules directory is actually different. So um, yeah. we felt this was like a just a good place to start. But yeah, absolutely. Let us know when you play with it. Is does this feel right or not? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, cool. So we got. It. So that's there. Um, oops. Okay. So we got a button. It rolls the dice. It calls our mutation. Our functions deployed. And let's um, let's try it locally first. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Cool. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> the and values change so much that they're just <laughs> bopping around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, but, you know, let's, okay, yeah. Can it run crisis? Maybe not. I mean, it's handling a bunch of updates a second. Oh my goodness. Yes, maybe not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's one person on the stream who's just, he's just been, this person has been clicking. Just over <laughs> over over again. We've already set up a uh, headless Chrome. Just to... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't know, actually, just optimistic updates for a random result here might not actually make a ton of sense, right? And that I guess we could generate a random number of client side and then do that. But then when the server decides on what it actually the random number is, it will be different. I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. Okay. And then, yeah, then of course we could deploy it out if we wanted to actually add yes. that to the, to the live URL. Roll the dice. Uh, 
the lap and he's in inside the ice cream. <laughs> it's a lifestyle. <laughs> um, So you pushed it up. Uh, did you put you pushed it up already? I think so. Let's see. Yeah. So if you go back to your project, okay. um, your what live stream Q and A? Yep. And then building. Oh yeah. There we go. We're we're building a new deployment. Um, if you want, we could. Oh wait, is it already done? It's done. It's already so done. Fast. <laughs> That's nice. I like when it happens that fast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so then, yeah, there we go. Third button right there. And that's, you know, walking through the flow end to end. We want everything to be this easy, right? You just kind of write your function, update your front end, just like how you get push and it got deployed like on stream in like seconds. Um, yep. Adding your dynamic functions and uh, your, query, your queries and mutations should be just, should have the same experience. How do you, how do you uh, change a, a schema or whatever, what, what terminology you want to use there, a document's yep. properties. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you essentially do a, a, a quote unquote migration there? Right. So let's actually walk through um, the Convex console for now um, to start. And that Convex, it's designed to make it as easy to start in the very beginning. So one of our philosophies is that we want to meet people where they are, right? Like we want yep. it to just, so in the beginning, here, you know, we did db.get, db.update. We didn't declare a schema at all. So there, you know, that's yes. the very beginning, there is no schema. But, and we'll take a look at the dashboard because this touches on another piece of that philosophy. Okay. Um, one of the things that's really important to Convex is that we want to start with things being very, very easy, but then as your app gets more sophisticated, as you start scaling on the number of say, rows in your database, but even say the number of people that are working on your app, we want Convex to grow with you. So we want that every single step along the way has a very gentle, shallow learning curve. So this is like one of the, one of the things that we've worked on is that um, things the, in Convex, your data starts without having any schema. If you want to just change the name of a field, you can just change it. But we actually do schema inference in the same way that TypeScript has like gradual typing. We okay. are working on something that's similar. So we don't have schemas full, you know, released yet. But the first step to it is this type of like schema inference piece where it looks at the data you have in your database and figures out that, OK, like there are three fields on each question. There's an ID, the text is a string, the votes are a floating point number or number from JavaScript. So then as you want to tighten up your app and add more rigor, you can start with it being extremely simple, but then eventually use this information to start enforcing schema and then doing migrations. So those are both like the schema enforcement and the migrations are like upcoming features for us. And the kind of the seed of all of them is this, uh, the schema inference uh, piece that's currently deployed. Is there a world where you have multiple schemas in the same uh in the same i don't know table <laughs> or the, the yeah. same type of the same type of question per se and then because you have that inference it's able to automatically figure out almost like a typescript like or check you know like yep. this type or this type so that you exactly. can i feel like if i'm if i'm understanding the mental model there that would allow you to let's say i push an update I change this from text to message, right? Yep. Well, now my schema inference says, well, the typing is actually text or message. We have some data in both. And then maybe there's a, you know, a migration or a script or some kind of process that eventually would be built in that would move data over. You would be able to opt in to, to doing that. Is that, you got, is that you, got it, you got it exactly right. We do the exact same thing that TypeScript does with union types. So okay. If, yeah, so here, you know, we'll have like, this is an object of ID text votes. And so then if you change text to messages, the type of this will be inferred to be ID text votes or ID message votes. And then we can have a migration for atomically switching between the two. Um, and this even helps for like, I mean, I, I use this a lot when I was working on my side project apps. Like sometimes I'll make a mistake and like 
have a float here or a string. And so it'll actually even tell you in this inferred schema that votes is float 64 or string. And then that can be like a signal to be like, okay, I need to go and clean that data up or like fix it. Interesting. Okay. I like that. That's, that's unique. That's a fresh take on that. I don't know that I've seen, there might be some prior art there that I just don't know about, but that's, that's unique and interesting to me. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So the, I think that answers my question about migrations. So we can see our functions inside of our dashboard. That's how we would essentially update or modify our, our schema. I feel like probably one of the things that you're trying to understand is with this new model, a lot of the vernacular, like the terminology that I'm using, it's probably too specific. It's probably too uh, outdated for the product that you're trying to build. You probably like imagine that I had <laughs> imagine I had no exposure to working with with databases or backends or any of this stuff before yeah. that I probably wouldn't be using a word like a schema migration. Um, right. <laughs> Yeah. Like, what does the word schema even mean? It's like some Greek word, I'm sure, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So I think that's, you got it exactly right. You know, I think it's so, because there's been so much prior art and people have built amazing databases over the past 50 years, right? Um, yeah. have been working on this for a long time. There's a ton of terminology and a ton of, even like we alluded to in the beginning of like, you know, like holy wars, right? Like no sequel versus sequel or like, I don't know, serializable versus relaxed consistency. All these things are like, you know, holy wars that have gone on that I think, you know, for 2022 are focusing on the wrong questions, right? And I think the yep. thing that we're working on is trying to come up with a different vocabulary that's much closer to the, app, uh, the place where people are building the apps. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. Should we pop into that Q and a, and there's some questions in the chat, but we could also walk through some of the questions on here that we we've already answered a few of them, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to, to talk through more of these. So I think we'll, we'll start with the ones in the chat and cool. feel free people to, uh, to also ask any questions and we'll, we'll try to get them answered. There was a question here about, uh, the database. Is it, you know, is it a key value store? Is it a relational data? And I see that, that James popped in here and was talking about <laughs> fully relational. Um, anything, any more flavor you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, and sh should I, sorry, scream noob question. Should I stop sharing my screen? Is that? Um, yeah, let's, or... let's, let's do that. Okay, we can, cool. uh, we can go back to our, go back to our full two person view. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cool. So uh, is Convex a relational database? Is it a non-relational database? And I think the answer is yes. Um, it's, yes. It is both in, yes. in some capacity. Um, and I, I want to go back to that idea of like incremental, gradual, really gentle changes over time. And one of the things that's really important to us is that people start with the tools that are really easy to get started with. So like Mongo, I think, was the original in the space, right? Like, it was just so easy to get started when you were building an app with Mongo back in 2011, right? 2012. Yep. And part of the reason is that you didn't have to think about how to fit your objects from JavaScript or whatever into some type of, like, normalized relational structure that was just totally different. And then you might need an ORM in the middle to mediate between the two. So getting started with the approach where you just take the state that's within your apps and shove it into your database is a really powerful, easy way to get started. And I think the wisdom in the relational model that's you know, from 50 years of people working on this often only really shows up when you are building a lot of new product features, right? I think the classic example would be that like, if I am kind of writing a Reddit clone or something like that, and I have like each post has its author. And normally I might just start with that author being a string, but then say like, I want to have a notion of profile that's separate from the author name within it's embedded within each post. I might want to pull out that state into a separate object, which represents here is like Sujay, here's my name, here's how many yep. 
the points I have, all of that. And then I want a pointer from the post to in its author field to this other thing. And then that is, you know, in terms of relational lingo, that is normalizing your data. That's getting closer to a uh, more relational schema. And that is something that really only matters when you start building more sophisticated features. So for Convex, that's we want to make that easy, gradual process. So something that kind of blows my mind as, again, as like a front end developer getting to talk to experts on the back end and experts with databases is that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but from my understanding of, of a tool like DynamoDB, right? Yeah. It's even though it's not technically a relational database, right? You can still build relational data very well that scales incredibly well, but it just depends on how you architect the, the schema, right? Like it depends on how you set up the, the actual relations. So I think what I'm hearing from you is, and I think that's one of the things that's been hard, harder for me to kind of fully grasp through starting on front end, working it into the back is, you know, as you get started, people, you know, the education resources you're given talk to you in SQL. They talk to you in Postgres. They talk to you in relation. They talk to you in, oh yeah. And then there's like document storage or no SQL. But what I feel like is missing or the nuance of all of that is like, well, actually they can all do relations if they right. all have their own unique architecture of how you do that. Is that, Absolutely. is that accurate? Yeah, it is. In this case, like, and I think, you know, everyone probably, it's one of those things where everyone defines it a little differently. I'll just yeah. speak for myself. I think like the idea of having data where you have these pointers and you have all of the data for a user is stored in one place and like a post or whatever will point to that. That is like the core of, of a relational data model in my mind. So in Dynamo, you can do that too. You would have a key for your user and then you'd have the posting point to it. But one of the things that then becomes difficult, and this is true for a lot of non-relational databases, is that they won't help you at all for maintaining those pointers. So it. it's very easy for your post sent to point to a user that was deleted. Got it. Okay. And that is something then that Convex, we haven't built this yet, but we've kind of architected to do it, will help you with. If you want to make sure that those foreign key references in you know <laughs> SQL language or yeah. those pointers are um, have integrity you know, the SQL term or that they point to valid data um, well the database will help you do that and make sure that your data model is consistent got it yeah there's a comment here I'm just catching up about talking about Dynamo do you allow unions lol lol <laughs> uh, yes we do um, so here it's like you can just put like if you present us a document that says, I had that message and that was a string. And then maybe I write another uh, object where the message field is a nested object that will get inferred as a union between string or object with whatever fields are inside of it. Got it. Got it. I see uh, one of our, our commenters found all the different outcomes for our role of dice. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, another question here, could you talk a little bit more about, I guess, the novel parts of, of Convex and why, why you opted to do a different strategy uh, to solve the solutions you're trying to solve or solve the problems you're trying to solve? Absolutely. I think one of the things that was really important for Convex is that since we started from the like product experience we wanted to give developers, we wanted things to be just super easy when it came to reactivity. We didn't want people to have to think about it. We actually yeah. talked to a lot of our friends and like colleagues who had started startups and used Firebase is that one thing they express a lot of um, like difficulty with was managing their subscriptions for so setting up their hierarchical data model in just the right way so that things would update real time and they'd have to like go and massage everything to make sure that the right parts of their app updated at the right times. So. Starting from that perspective, like we want really high quality subscriptions. We want really high quality mutations. We want these queries to just, you don't want people to have to learn a totally new language. Um, that like made it so we have to kind of, we had to build a lot of stuff end to end to get that to work. So, you know, just to walk through it, we have the WebSockets coming in, the WebSockets talk to this like uh, this component on the server, which manages our like sync protocol between them. 
that when it runs JavaScript functions, talks to V8, and we manage V8 directly. We kind of determine, we change things in its environment to make it deterministic. And then in V8, we talk to our database where we, you know, implemented a like serializable database, you know, on and we use another database as our storage engine under the hood, but we have, we control timestamps and we detect whether things can commit safely. We do all of those database types of things. And then we have the whole subscription layer of saying that this JavaScript query, when it ran, it looked at these rows. Um, over here, this mutation, when it ran, touched these rows. Can we very efficiently map that this mutation touched this query and then route it to the web socket that was listening on it? So all that stuff together has to work really tightly. It has to work in concerted effort to get the experience to be really good. So I think that's like some of the why we had to build a lot of new things and there's a lot of novel stuff in here as opposed to just gluing things together. I like that you said you started from the product experience that you wanted customers to have and work backwards to the technology that would get you there. Because based on my understanding, you know, your team has a lot of experience working with backends, databases, all of the distributed systems that go into making this incredible experience. So with a clean sheet of paper, a blank page, if we work backwards from the product experience, I can see how you might've landed on some, some newer uh, decisions. Yeah, that's the dream, you know? <laughs> yeah, so I guess the follow-up to that is, or the, the interesting thing is, how do you balance the new novel technology with a developer's desire for portability. There was a question in here about, yeah. um, you know, vendor lock-in. If I yeah. if I if I use convex, does that mean that I'm I'm beholden to this to this vendor lock-in? I know that some some databases they they give you tools to migrate in or migrate out, or some backends they you know they pride themselves on choosing a tool that's open source and you can like run with Docker locally. What's yep. your What's your worldview or what's your your thought on that? Absolutely. And, you know, to preface this, we're still figuring some of this out, right? We're in beta. We've like yeah. built out everything. I think, you know, the kind of the highest, the first, the highest level thing is that, you know, we don't want to like lock people in to use Convex because it's yeah. just really hard to migrate out. Like we want to win because we want people to use us because it's like solving all these problems that you don't have to deal with. Right. Yeah. And I think I actually personally take a lot of inspiration from Vercel. I mean, I think Y'all have done an incredible job with Next. And with Next, you, you're able to write your app. If you want to just Next, you want to export it and you want to serve it yourself or run a spin up a node server, you can do that. But you get all of these incredible superpowers when you deploy it on yourself. And that's like, I think, the rough approach we are taking. You know, some ideas that we've sketched out. And of course, community feedback on this when we're in beta is going to like help decide what to work on. Um, one idea is that like we're going to have to build a local like convex dev server so that you can run convex on your own machine. So if you're on the train or whatever, it, like everything is self-contained. And you know, like if you and that will, if you're going to be running it on your own machine, we'll probably then we'll probably make it open source, right? And then if you want to deploy that, sure, go for it. Um, I think like then it'll be if you know, hopefully then. Deploying it on Convex will be just so much more magical and will take care of all of those details of deployment that you otherwise wouldn't have to do. But I think that's kind of like the rough idea of what we're thinking. And be curious to hear if you know that that resonates with people. Yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to developers about the open source slash business model that Vercel has. We build yeah. open source software. We believe very deeply in open source software. And at the same time, we provide a product that you can use for free or paid if you would like and make it really easy to deploy that open source software. If for at any reason you decide you don't like for sale anymore, you can take it and go put it on your own server. And what you said resonates with me because you want to win with a great product. You don't want to win with being locked into something. And that's one of the things that, you know, I and Vercel, I think, believe really deeply in is like, if for some reason our product isn't meeting your, your needs as an individual or as a team, you have the flexibility to take that and 
put it on your own infrastructure if you would like. So I, I agree with the, the positioning and the, the sentiment there. Another thing I'll add there is like you mentioned about how like you, you can use Rosell for free. And that's like, if you're playing around with it and like doing your side projects, like that's an incredible experience. And you yeah. get just like amazing deployment for just like my side app. And then there's all of these features then that help you use it at work. And then those are the things you pay for. And that's another yeah. thing like between like Purcell or GitHub is another thing that we get inspiration from and that we really want people to use Convex as hobbyists and like not have any friction to doing so, right? You don't have to go and pull out your credit card to use Rosell. Um, yes. And yes. that's like, and then from there, like if you then want to go build a successful company on it, then like there are costs to doing, you know, whether it's like running infrastructure or whatnot, like then, yeah, like hopefully it makes, we're providing enough value that you would want to pay for us. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there will be a free tier post beta where you can kind of try it out? And yeah, that's the intent is that like people who are using it for front or, you know, for, for fun, using it for um, their side projects should be able to, yeah, without any friction, just be like, go and use it. And yeah. Awesome. Well, I have one more question before we wrap up and it's, I see um, two related questions in here, which are essentially talk to me through some of the ideal use cases or applications or workloads that you that you're seeing beta customers or ideal customers start to build with with Convex. Yeah. So the ideal like project for Convex is a web app that's using React that needs dynamic global state. So it needs it's not. Um, just purely static content that can be pre-rendered and then pushed out yep. to the edge. It needs something that's going to be user dependent. It's going to be changing over time. So, you know, examples that come up are like things like Asana, right? Or you have a to-do app or like things like Reddit, right? Or uh, you need to go do our Hacker News clone like every other <laughs> backend does. Um, and things where there's uh, data that changes over time and then needs to be presented to the user are the, the best fit for Convex. Got it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Does that answer Does that answer the question about will there be spelt support in the future? <laughs> ah, yeah, so like I think a lot of things, you know, because we're just, you know, just getting started, early startup. Yeah. Um, we focus specifically on React because we want to make it as amazing as possible. But the general principles of reactivity, reactivity working end to end from all the yep. way on the browser to the database, um, yep. have been, they've been taken over front end, right? Like there's all of these other frameworks that are coming up and we'll be working on adding support for all of you or cell solid, whatever is going on, because these, um, we've designed the framework to be that there's like another core of managing the web socket and managing the state. And then the bindings between that and the react hooks is, you know, like a pretty thin layer. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Well. I think I think that will wrap us up for today. Thank you so much for for talking me through the product and doing the demo, writing some code live. It was fun. I had a good time. Yeah, yeah, it's super fun. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Lee. Yeah, and thank you everyone too who joined in live, or for those time travelers who are watching this in the future for for answering questions. Maybe if you want to just give a, a a quick plug on where you can try out Convex and and if people want to sign up for beta. Access yeah, we'd love we'd love to have you you know come join our beta, build some cool stuff on Convex. Um, go to convex.dev and um, just you sign up for a beta key, and we will get you in as soon as we can. And then once you join, there'll be um, a, is a Convex community Slack channel where you can talk and ask questions and get feedback. And we would absolutely love to see you there. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, for the stream today and it was great talking. We'll have to do another one in the future. All right. See